Okay, guys, please take your seats. This is a good time to remind you to uh, connect through the application to the conference. You can, uh, you can uh, watch everything live and you can connect with the speakers. Um, also, those of you who haven't uh, gone to this sh showbox station, I recommend, you know, it's, it's very friendly and, uh, and you get a video clip of yourself in uh, 10 seconds. Uh, we are moving to the next uh, panel, which is uh, journalism ethics under pressure. And I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Teila Altschuller of the Israel Democracy Institute to moderate it and uh, introduce the panelists. Teila, please. Hi, so nice to be here again. Thank you, Uri, for inviting me. So it takes a, villi a, a village to raise a child. That's what the well-known African proverb teaches us. Um, and then comes to mind the Oscar Award win uh, winning movie, Spotlight, the true story of how uh, the Boston Globe uncovered the, this massive scandal of uh, child abuse and, uh, and cover up by the, by, by the Catholic Church. Um, and you think to yourself that maybe it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to molest a child. Um, it takes a village to enable corruption. It takes a village to sustain social ills. Um, and the question is whether this Pulitzer Prize winning work of the Boston Globe could actually be replicated today at, two, at, at, at 2017. And, and unfortunately, um, resourceful and, 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 and brave investigative journalists are hard to come by in 2017. They're buried in an, in an era um, before social media, um, in, in a time when people actually got their news from a newspaper, um, and when trust in journalists was actually high and not as low as it is today. Um, and there are those who argue um, that in a digital uh, world of social media and blogs, the, there's actually no longer a need for ma mainstream media. Um, after all, the information is out there somewhere, and someone in the crowd is likely to volunteer and, and share it. Think about, um, uh, uh, think about uh, uh, a situation like, like the one occurred in, uh, in Boston, maybe. All it would have taken was one victim to post a Facebook post um, that he's been molested, and then others would have come forward uh, as well. We we saw we we've we've been seeing uh, uh, stories like that. Think about the famous actor Bill Cosby, who was brought to his knees actually uh, by social media. Um, once the first report hit the the social media, a fresh one popped up almost every day usually reported first through Facebook. And, un and nonetheless, um, the loss of investigative journalism is not something that we should readily accept. Um, the problem is not only one of relying on viral posts or, or volunteers um, uh, who don't get paid. Um, the basic benefits of, of traditional media are, are obvious. You know, the ability to employ journalists to work on stories for a longer period of time, knowing that in the end, sometimes nothing would come out, um, as well as maintaining insurance funds uh, to pay for libel lawsuits, sometimes slap suits. Um, but also, mainstream media provide the public three essential components going back to, this time, to the time of Aristotle. Um, explanation of facts, for instance, context, which is so important, and also a story with a beginning, middle, and end, one that actually connects the dots that is so important. Um, but also mainstream media provide the public, um, uh, sorry, in, in 2017, it will take a village to buttress those who are capable of holding up a mirror to society. But it's even more than that. For within the pressure created by the village, we are here to talk about media ethics. It is no secret that journalism is undergoing a crisis 
Fewer and, and increasingly overworked journalists are acquiring less in-depth in -depth familiarity with their fields of coverage, and the journalistic immune system is becoming less capable of withstanding the forces of spin and deception. This makes ethics now, more than ever, essential for high-quality journalistic work. Ethics in the sense of both specific rules and a basic standard of skepticism has many benefits. It serves as a built-in, sorry for the expression, bullshit detector. Um, and as a self-defense mechanism against manipulative information and news sources. It also increases a journalist's self-awareness, illuminating certain fa facets um, of the profession that are often gray and ambiguous. Well, this is the information age, ladies and gentlemen. However we may define information, reported are flooded with it. They are constantly surrounded by a huge quantity of statements, documents, messages, posts, and first-hand experiences from the field. The time it takes to question every single rumor and statement is more than the lifespan of, of even the longest live journalists. Even if a journalist is suspicious about the information, the matter will not necessarily conclude with a journalistic inquiry. In some cases, um, no such inquiry will even be launched. Yet even journalists with minimal ethical standards must still obtain and provide information. In order to do this, they must learn to make critical distinctions between information that is more credible and information that is less so. And for, that, and for that, they need a common standard. They need knowledge. They need organizational culture. They need a sense of morality. They need, they need sometimes a good regulating institu institution. And of course, they need a healthy dose of skepticism. Because after all, how do people and organizations inspire trust? They make choices based on justifiable, justifiable, justifiable standards. They take others into account in their decisions, and then they do what they say they will do. Everyone thinks they have strict limits. Purity, the heroine of Jonathan Franzen's uh, recent novel said, yeah, everyone thinks they have strict limits until they cross them. Traditional media, uh, particularly newspapers, are suffering from the impact of structural and market changes which have reduced the, prof the profitability of media enterprises. In response, severe cuts have been imposed in editorial department, weakening the quality of journalism and sacrifice reporting standards in pursuit of commercial objectives. The rise of social media, uh, legitimizes the use of amateurs in a, weak, um, in a weakened traditional media industry. So welcome, welcome to the panel that um, will discuss ways to maintain ethical norms in such a challenging environment. And with me, three very honorable men, only men. <laughs> Sorry for that. Mr. William Booth, the Washington Post Jerusalem Bureau Chief. Um, Mr. Booth served as a bureau chief in Mexico, Miami, and Los Angeles, um, and as a, a pop culture correspondent for the style section. He has covered violent upheavals in Ukraine, Egypt, Libya, Iraq, Haiti, Honduras, and the Balkans. Uh, Yair, Mr. Yair Tarchitsky is an Israeli journalist and the chairman of the Union of Journalists in Israel. He has written and edited for prominent Israeli media outlets, and he has also served, uh, he also serves, we serve together actually, as a member of the uh, directorate of the, of the Israeli uh, Press Council. Uh, Yair is also the co-founder and co-editor of the Movement for Public Journalism in Israel. Ellen Abbey, Mr. Ellen Abbey, is the director of internet and media at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, where he oversees seven websites in English and in Hebrew, and manages press relations and live video programming. Before that, uh, he was um, executive vice president at the Jerusalem Post, editor-in-chief of jpost.com, a Brooklyn native. Ellen lives in Jerusalem with his family. Uh, and last but not least, Mr. Owen Persico, journalist and media critic at the Seventh Eye, an independent Israeli web website devoted to, um, uh, 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 to journalism. Um, uh, per Persico has written extensively about the corrupted practices of Israeli media for the past 
decade or so, while encouraging all journalists to fulfill their obligation to serve the public. So please, will you take your seats? And while they're taking their seats, I'll just say that we are going to run the panel um, with two rounds, one that describes challenges um, and one that suggests solution. So, William. Yes. I'll open up with you. Sure. Why not? Um, two, two very tough and broad questions. Um, the first, I think, would be what are the differences between print and online uh, journalism? Uh, and what are their, um, uh, the implications of those differences on media ethics? And be as broad as, as you can, as we were talking uh, 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 before. And just as a preparation, um, uh, the, um, uh, the second question is going to be in what sense does this um, um, attack on, on journalism generally, both in America and as we experience it uh, here in Israel, affect ethical practices <laughs> of journalists? Okay, Th that's a good, those are good questions. That's a, uh, a good number of them. Um, so, <laughs> Only um, two. no, I like this. It's like the journalist always says, I have, I have one question, but it's always five. And, <laughs> and, and I, I was trained in that technique also. Um, so, um, uh, that's a great question. So at the Washington Post, uh, maybe just start there a little bit, um, uh, the, the days of like print versus digital are way over. Um, we are a digital first organization. That's not just uh, me doing um, Jeff Bezos speak. I mean, that's, that's how we live now. We go through three or four or five editing desks a day. Uh, we have a social media desk. We have an alert desk. We have, uh, we include, uh, all the social media tricks and, 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 and travesties in all of our reporting. Um, uh, there's no um, f firewall, there's no difference between the two. I get up in the morning thinking about digital and I go to bed at night thinking about digital and when someone calls me on the telephone and wakes me up at three in the morning, I'm obviously thinking about digital. So that's what we do. Uh, the Washington Post still has a print edition, which is uh, kind of maybe profitable. Jeff Bezos doesn't tell us whether it is, but he's still <laughs> publishing it. it and, and it's an elegant product, uh, like the New York Times one, which is even way more elegant <laughs> on Sundays. Um, so we keep doing that. So, so there's not, uh, in my mind, like as I do my job, a difference between being a digital reporter and a print reporter. Um, the, 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 to answer deeper into your question, I mean, the, 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 um, uh, the emphasis on uh, digital reporting or today's reporting is fast. You have to have high speed. And so um, we do not screw around. We go fast. And um, any reporter uh, at the Washington Post or anywhere else who is slow is soon to be run over uh, by a truck called his, uh, ter his or her termination. And um, so, so this is a propulsion to go fast. Does that mean that our reports are less clear or less accurate? Probably, and some days, and maybe more so at the beginning. There's lots of systems we put in place now where we, um, where we don't have to do a full report immediately. We can just come out with something fast, just the first few paragraphs, and keep moving, and then add to it all day long. So. Um, in that regard, um, I think that serves the readers and it serves the metabolism of, of what people want, whether to get to the subject of this thing, whether that makes our ethics less, makes us kind of cheaters, uh, corner cutters, faster, I mean, whether faster makes us like less accurate, it probably, it probably ultimately does, um, um, but not as much as I would have feared, I'm an old guy, uh, that I would have feared as all this started happening to us and me and all of us uh, the last 10 years. It's surprisingly not so bad. And, and if you look at the French, Washington Post French election coverage, there's tons of material being pumped out um, every couple of minutes. And um, it's a little self-correcting if they get something wrong, if they overstate how many French voters have actually participated or, or they, they make some other errors. Um, but the, the system is a little bit self-correcting internally. They pull the story back a little bit, people make changes, and they, they keep going on. So speed is where it is right now. And um, 
I think the the efforts that the post was put in and other organizations is good to try to to have the speed but not have it run off the rails we can ask just one more quick Please. question in this, um, uh, in this regard you're talking about one side of the um, uh, of the of, of the story the one of, of the of, of news production right right but how do you react to a situation where there are actually let's say about one billion media critics yes on okay Facebook? okay so there's 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 an up and a down to that Okay, so the up is, I, I distinctly remember um, the, the times of my career, my reporting career, where I saw like big changes happening right before they were happening. And um, I won't go through all of them, but one of the recent ones was I was covering like a Crimea when the Russians were uh, taking over, invaded Crimea, took it over, or took it back. Um, and suddenly, instead of looking at traditional news sites, I was following the best people tweeting. Um, and I had a translator translating from the Russian and from Ukraine. And we're Being driving. That, that does that. I know at least from the Hebrew. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and so we're driving around and like we're just looking uh, like Twitter is driving our reporting day. Mm. Like this is happening. That's happening. Oh, the Russians are here. No, they're not here. There's a, a pop up protest here. Some guy got shot on the street here. There's a little mini demonstration. Oh, this guy is like a local leader who's popped up and who's saying yes or no to this. And I ran around for three or four weeks chasing Twitter. And it was a great reporting tool. It was really powerful. And um, I loved it. I thought I'm, I'm like, like mainlining news <laughs> into my uh, junkie, uh, whatever you, you call it, the heroin. Uh, I was just like, oh, my God, let's follow this guy. And then you learned in a day or two, oh, this guy is good or this woman is good <laughs> or this is full of baloney. And you could use it. So the upside is you could use it as a reporting tool. And then the downside, you can ask me another one after our other friends talk, but like about like the downside of like media criticism and constantly being watched. And I, I could say more about that. It's <laughs> one of my. Okay. So just before I move on, um, I'm, um, I'm referring to the second question. Um, the past couple of days, for me at least, were so frustrating in terms of the relationship of media and politics in Israel. Um, I'm sure that, uh, you know, each one of you who actually follow the news can uh, understand, uh, um, can understand um, uh, why, but you do uh, uh, live in, uh, in America. You're the representative of, of American media here in this uh, 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 panel. Um, and, and one really has to admit that um, this, you know, attacking by politicians, attacking the professionalism of journalists has become really, really common. Does that affect or have any effect on, on, on media ethics? I, th I think the, the um, I, you, I, I thought about that uh, question. I mean, I think that politicians um, criticizing the press is as old as politicians. It's, it always happens. And the, the saying used to be like when a politician went really negative about the press, meaning that politician was going down the toilet, right? So that was the last refuge to try to change the conversation. I don't think that's true anymore. The conversation now is that you're always kind of in opposition to the press. Bibi Netanyahu had a little cheeky video the other day about um, the Hamas charter change in which he, he frames the entire thing, not about Hamas, not about Israel's response to Hamas, not about the relationship between Israel and Gaza, any of these things. He started with, the Guardian published this incredulous report about blah, blah, blah. The Gar if you read the Guardian report or the New York Times report, they were solid. I mean, maybe he didn't have the exact lead he would want, but it was like Hamas attempts to moderate. Hamas is trying to do something. And then the report like deconstructs what Hamas said and has tons of Israeli voices and skeptical voices saying, well, this is like a, not true or it's a feint or they're trying, it's all about internal politics. But like it, Netanyahu tees it up as the, the press is lying to you and now I'm gonna tell you the truth. So there's a guy in Washington, D.C., I'm forgetting his name right now, Donald Trump, and um, <laughs> uh, he's a, a master at this. So uh, uh, I'm wondering whether, whether and for how long it works. I mean, there is still, uh, the, the story is not ended yet. Whether if you endlessly, Trump, fake news, fake, I just looked at his Twitter feed this morning. 15 references to fake news over the last 
14 hours. Maybe that works, or maybe people will say, uh, maybe people, we'll see, we'll see. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not the default position and everyone will say, oh yeah, it's all media uh, shenanigans and lies. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Ellen, I want to refer to you now. You're a veteran journalist and senior editor. You exercised journalism in the, I would say, historic times that influenced and shaped and created the connectivity and, and media revolutions. Um, so what really has the biggest influence on media ethics? Is it technology? Is it the reactions that media companies um, have towards it? Is it the like failing business models? What exactly has uh, influence on, on media ethics? Look, the, the biggest influence on media ethics is the lack of knowledge and understanding of what media ethics are and can be, both by journalists and their publishers and the owners and the public at large and certainly politicians. So, it, you know, I, I often, I've talked many times about media ethics and I say it's like trying to get your kids to eat their broccoli. It, it, it's almost an instant turnoff to talk about ethics. And I'm talking about when I'm talking to journalists, let alone people outside the profession. By the way, I have a really good recipe for broccoli, so really it doesn't have to be as bad as you think. <laughs> but what I found in my research and in my work and in reading and studying the media are that there is as much going on on the negative side as on the positive side. What do I mean by that? There's been a lot of talk about the fracturing of the media and certainly there is a lot of bad media out there, a lot of unethical journalism out there. The celebrity driven puffery news and, and uh, propaganda and polemics pretending to be news and many, many other things. At the same time, there are many new efforts to improve the ethical knowledge and understanding and strengths of journalists. And there are as many positive aspects, many, as many positive things underway, maybe not as well known and certainly not as uh, viral as, you know, puffery journalism about Jared and Ivanka. But as there, there are a lot, there's a lot out there and a lot of tools out there for journalists in this day and age to improve their own understanding and practice of ethical journalism. Okay, so let me just ask you one more question because we are still in the, let's say, challenges uh, 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 around of this uh, of this uh, panel. Do you think there's there, do you think there's any difference between sectorial media? It could be the Jewish press in America or the English speaking the English language uh, uh, media in, in, in Israel, um, and and the general traditional media. Where exactly um, do you find harsher problems in terms of ethics? Uh. Look, the sectoral media, or you could call it uh, niche media, ethnic media, journalism that covers the gay community, that covers the Jewish community, that covers the environmental community, they are what I call permanently embedded journalists, meaning that most of the journalists in that world come from the world they write about. So in environmental journalists, many of them are environmentalists, or the gay media was developed by gays who felt that the mainstream media did not give them enough press coverage. So there is an inherent deeper knowledge of the issues, but there is also a built-in challenge when you're writing about your own community, you're potentially airing your own dirty laundry. And there isn't a, a community in the larger world that likes it, and in smaller communities that occasionally feel at risk or are a minority community, the Jewish newspaper in Romania, you know, or a, the, uh, a, a newspaper for the Roma community in Italy, and there are minority papers in Europe as well. I'm not just talking Jewish papers, I'm talking papers of the ethnic minorities within European countries. Um, if you write about that, you face tremendous pressure from within your own community to give a good face to the outside world about what's going on in your community. You don't want to air that. So um, the challenges on minority, niche, ethnic journalism are actually greater, I think, in many ways. And at the same time, these media are smaller and more fragile, and the people who work for them are less trained. And so I don't minimize the ethical challenges of covering a Trump White House. Um, and Washington, where I spent many years, is a sinkhole of journalistic problems with the revolving door between government and uh, lobbying and the media. And so there are many, many challenges there. But one of the things I found in my research is that, in fact, the smaller media are more fragile and more at risk. 
and face more challenges. And many of the journalists feel compelled not to, as even though they believe in journalism, they feel compelled not to air their own community's dirty laundry to the outside world, but rather to defend it. And they take that as their uh, primary task. Um, so small media, and it can be any kind of niche specialty uh, media we, you want to pick, and in the world today there are many more than in the past. They, in fact, I think face at least as many of the traditional ethical challenges, business, advertising pressures, uh, things like that, as well as uh, the challenges of doing real reporting for a community that doesn't really necessarily want to hear it. Interesting. So let's uh, refer to you, uh, Yair, and we're going to do that in English. Usually we communicate in Hebrew. It's going to be interesting. Um, so there's no tenure, no job security. What happens to a journalist in such a world? Not in terms of his ability to pay his mort mortgage payments, but rather um, with respect to his ability to work ethically or in an ethic uh, 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 manner. We all know that politicians um, has have been hating the media throughout history. You just referred to that, uh, uh, William. Uh, we also know that um, owners of media outlets or CEOs or, or, or you know, senior editors um, um, always um, threaten uh, uh, journalists um, that they would get uh, uh, fired. But it seems to us that there is some kind of a t deterioration here. So could you elaborate on that? Yeah. First of all, I must apologize. I'm after a sleepless night in the Knesset uh, trying to practice uh, freedom of the press um, in all the public uh, broadcast uh, issues. Uh, uh, so I'm totally exhausted. If I'm saying stupid things, it's just because of this. It's not because of me. It's because you uh, learned from the Knesset members <laughs> how to communicate. Yeah. I had a great example. I, I think uh, with journalists and ethics in those days, we have two problems. The first one is the journalists just don't know what's ethics. And I'm, I'm not only speaking about they don't know every uh, detail in the code of ethics. They don't know that this, not all of them, but a lot of them don't, don't know that there is this kind of things ethics. Because I don't think that in their uh, own perception, they think about themselves as journalists uh, as William uh, think about himself. They more than that think about themselves as a content creator. So today they create content in Walla, and tomorrow they create content in some advertise uh, uh, in some advertising uh, firm, and it's for them it's the same. It's about the creation and not about uh, serving the public uh, and giving him tools to understand reality. Uh, I love it. It's the creation and not the mission. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I think this is one of the <coughs> biggest problems because I remember when I worked in Mariv, I went to my uh, to the head of the news department in in some. He told me, "Yeah, put this uh, this information." I told him, "Listen, I, I can't do it. It's not it's not ethical." So I told him, "Okay, you have my permission to cross <laughs> the ethics lines. It's okay." <laughs> I said, okay, mm -hmm. and I refused, but I think, and, and now I'm going to what you asked, that uh, even when journalists know what's the ethics and really want uh, to practice the ethics codes, uh, they're afraid because, uh, uh, as you said, journalists in Israel are weak. And if we will take now a journalist that is in that dilemma that I was, and and uh, and he think, okay, should I refuse? Because I think that everyone in this room would say, of course, if uh, your uh, boss is telling you you should uh, do something not ethical, you say, oh no, I can't. I'm like a doctor. I don't think that a doctor. It's it's obvious that a doctor would refuse to I don't know uh, kill his patient or something like this. But uh, uh, I think that most of the journalists in this situation would say, okay, I, I want to, I want my job. I need to pay, I don't know, my rent, uh, not even the mortgage, rent. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> uh, I want to pay my rent, I have to, 
uh, bring food for my children and 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 they would say okay i think that most of the times the the psychological uh, way of thinking is much more complicated because uh, it's a small thing it's not the big thing if i would have like the big investigations about Sheldon Edison of course i would refuse but in the small things it's okay and and i had a lot of conversation with journalists that says yeah i i'm compromising a lot because once a year i want to do what i believe and uh, i understand from where it comes but i i can't accept it me as a journalist i couldn't accept these kind of things and i always refused and i became problematic but i i i understood that the problem and um, is not only in the individual journalist but in the infra uh, infrastructure that <coughs> when you want first of all i think we should ex ex expect for every journalist to do the right thing uh, it's not what what I'm trying to say. It's not that uh, someone should escape from responsibility. Everyone, as an individual, has a responsibility. But I think that we, as a society, or we, as a collective of uh, journalists, should not think only how to uh, make the individual d decide the good decision, but change the reality to a way that he would be able to do it. That in the that in the, this. A moment that he should uh, think I'm going uh, with the ethics or going with my with the <laughs> salary that he, he shouldn't choose this uh, or, or probably he sh that it shouldn't be so di dichotomic that he would say okay I know that if I would choose the right uh, the right decision I will be protected or, or at least partly protected uh, and, and 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 I think that what we understood is that part of the solution, and I'm, I won't talk about yeah, it at all because I know it's the second, it's the second <laughs> part, but I would give a hint of what I'm going to talk about later. It's a, part of the problem was the journalist, I think for more than 30 years, they organized labor in the journalism sector, like in most of the sector in Israel almost totally died. And we understood that part of the solution is, is confronting this problem together. Uh, unionize people, think uh, as, uh, as not as individuals, but as a collective in, in, in the conscious way and with, with the power to, to change things. So we're going to talk about this prophecy and how it got materialized a little bit um, uh, later. And now I'm going to refer to you, uh, uh, Oren. Um, you obviously concentrating on, on the state of, uh, of Israel, but could you please diagnose or, or, or even describe for us some kind of, um, of a list um, of <coughs> all what you uh, see as challenges or as, as main challenges in uh, um, in, in, in journalistic ethics in, in Israel? Well, first of all, we have the same problems like uh, journalists have in other countries, which is the digital era. Uh, I mean, Facebook and, and, and Google take most of the money from digital advertising. And of course, the print advertising is way down. And you just don't have the money uh, to do the journalistic work that you need. Uh, again and again, you're asked to do more with less, and that's just impossible. In Israel, we have some unique problems on top of the usual problems. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we have something called Israel Ayom, uh, the daily uh, free newspaper that is published by the good friend of our Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Shell Ensign. And uh, that changed not only the landscape of the uh, media in Israel and not only deteriorated the ethics of uh, other print newspapers, it also changed the uh, advertising um, the advertising market. It had such a large uh, effect on the prices of advertisement in the print media. And because Israel is such a small, uh, country and a small market, uh, it had ripple effects on other uh, media as, as well, in the digital and also on TV. Another um, problem, because Israel is such a small country, um, the, we don't have a large audience uh, to try and get uh, money from. I mean, uh, the New York Times can have <coughs> millions of digital subscribers. Um, 
the Hebrew-speaking audience in Israel and abroad is very limited, and you don't see, uh, except for Haaretz, you don't see any real um, effort to try and charge for online uh, content, um, because there's just not enough people who would pay for it. Um, another thing uh, that uh, comes from the uh, fact that we are a small country is the what what is called um, the club, right? The big tycoons of media, the big uh, tycoons of uh, business, uh, the uh, politicians. They all know each other. They're friends with each other, and then. It's just a great uh, uh, opportunity for corruption to arise. We're talking about a place where the most influential publisher, uh, Noni Moses, met with the Prime Minister of Israel and discussed uh, selling the integrity of his entire uh, journalistic staff and saying... And cartelizing the market and cartelizing the market and saying, I will make sure that you will get good coverage in my newspaper and website. So I don't think we're just talking about ethical problems. This is um, maybe legal criminal problems. It's obviously a corruption of the profession. And um, I, I think talking about just about ethics is just like a luxury. Uh, that we cannot afford now. Mm. There, the, 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 the problems are so severe, we have to talk about corruption of the, of the profession. That's too bad. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, and, it, and it's sad. Um, uh, William, I, before we go to the, to, the, um, uh, to the other round, I wanna just ask you, a, um, perhaps again, but, but let's elaborate on this a little bit more. You're an un outsider here in Israel. You're an American uh, journalist who live in, uh, uh, in Israel. Before that, you covered Mexico. Um, <coughs> what can you say about the differences between the American media and Mexican, maybe, or, or the Israeli media? Is there some kind of a structural difference, or maybe it's a cultural difference um, that influenced the matter? Um. I am a good, clueless American here, so I can answer this uh, topic uh, in my, that way. I mean, the um, or Orin just said like some profound things. Like, so I like the is reading the Israeli media in translation and like in English, right? And so many days I feel like it's tough and combative and and producing lots of news. But he pointed out a very important thing that it's it's a small country and uh, a small number of players. And if those Nani Moses uh, 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 tapes and reports are true, that's uh, a, a extremely disturbing uh, event, right? And so, I come. I would right before I moved to Israel, I was in Mexico, and the, I looked at your question beforehand: What's the difference between Mexico and Israeli media in terms of ethics or struggles? Uh, in Mexico, journalism gets you killed. So um, the this is something they haven't thought about yet. Uh, they thought about it, but they didn't uh, do it. <laughs> yeah, they, not yet to come. Every it's on the list. I mean, in, in Mexico, pursuing journalism is extremely, uh, in some of the kind of narco states, very difficult states, Veracruz, Michoacan, Nuevo León. Uh, spend a, I've spent a lot of time there, and I got a lot of help from my journalistic friends there. I mean, it's very difficult. Uh, pursue and highly dangerous. I mean, they, they kill people often. And um, uh, here we're blessed by nobody's getting killed, but it's not mortgage, it's rent, as Yara said. So um, there are cultural differences. Um, I think the Israeli media is kind of tough, but I was about to say that, and then Oren was uh, reminding me of of, of, of everyone knows each other here and everyone is connected to each other here. So sometimes I think, oh, how brave because you're really being tough on your friend you went to the army with or you went to Technion with or you know from Tel Aviv University and he's in labor now or Likud and you're still punching it out. Okay, that's great. But like the, the thing that my friend here just said is, is true. It's, it's a small country and I think like ethically as Yara was saying too, the um, the pressures can be felt here very quickly, and the system kind of still works here. But as you guys have been staying up in the Knesset all night, seeing and in other forum, it 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 might not be true forever. 
Um, so I would, I would watch, I would watch and protect what you have. Um, because look at Russia, one of the biggest powerful countries. I know the Russian media is shit, like completely terrible, and. Um, and that's a powerful, open country with lots of money and lots of, lots of gears and lots of things you don't see. And look at the Russian media today. It's terrible. So if you, like, if you don't think you can lose it, look at them. Thinking about this proximity reminds me of, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just take a risk and do something. Um, you know, Israel, Israel national um, a poet, Chaim Nachman Bialik once said that when you try to translate something, it's like kissing a woman uh, through a silk uh, scarf. Um, and still, this proximity of relationship or different institutions um, within Israeli society is usually described in Hebrew and it rhymes really well. Um, they say it's the relationship of hon, which stands for fortune, and then shilton, which stands for government, and then Iton, which stands for newspaper, and then Rishion, which stands for license to get, you know, a television station or whatever. Um, and it also rhymes with Edelson. Uh, <laughs> so perhaps before we move to the second round, we should have, you know, taken uh, um, this into consideration as well. And the second round actually is going to deal with these solutions. Um, and these Could I just interrupt one second? Of course, okay. you know, we protect freedom I, of the press I, here. I, I think that uh, Oren's comments are extremely provocative and interesting, and I wanted to just make one or two points about them before we moved on, because I think he has a, a lot of what he says makes sense. And certainly the corrupt relationship or potentially corrupt relationship between Netanyahu and Noni Moses um, is uh, the media corruption writ large. Let me tell you, however, that, that as I started to talk about embedded media, niche media, Israeli, all of Israel is something like that. But th this happens in other places too. Don't get, don't get it, don't, don't uh, be mistaken. When I was a s graduate student, I spent the summer as an intern at a tiny paper in a tiny town, in a tiny corner of the state of Oregon, so far from the West Coast that it was in a different time zone. And in this small town, I went to cover a school board meeting where they discussed putting a bond issue on the ballot to spend a million dollars, which was in a small town is a lot of money, to build a gymnasium because the voters previously had voted against it and they wanted to uh, get it on again. So that I, I, it was a Tuesday night. I, Wednesday morning, I woke it, walked in, I wrote this story. As I finished it, I handed it to the publisher, the owner of this small paper. As I handed it to him, the school superintendent came down the street in his little orange vest for the Elks Club, which if you don't know what it is, I'm not going to bother getting into it. But Do not mess with the Elks right. Club. So the, the publisher was putting on his orange vest as well, and they took the two of them, took my story, into the officer, office of the publisher and rewrote it so that the article would come out more favorable towards influencing the local community to add maybe three or four cents to their individual tax bills to pay for this bond issue to build a gymnasium for the local school. So the, the c coziness of uh, leadership elites and political elites in business, government, and politics, and media happens everywhere. And um, it is certainly problematic when it happens in, at the largest level, but it also happens at all levels, and when I was a business editor at a much larger daily newspaper, I spent more time in the publisher's office than the editor-in-chief because my stories infected the advertising of the newspaper. So I understand that, but I don't think, and we'll get to this into the solutions, that necessarily, in fact, I think just by uh, high effect, the opposite, that this situation, in fact, requires a greater emphasis and talk about media ethics. It is not an academic conversation. No, I, I totally agree, and uh, we need to remember that you know the size of the state of Israel is of a medium size, uh, I would say, a city in America, um, and the, the political culture is a political culture of a kibbutz. So, in this sense, uh, it really it really has an influence, uh, and we haven't even touched the national security aspects, uh, <laughs> which again I think has a lot of uh, um, uh, influence over ethic uh, uh, ethical issues. Um, but as I said before, I want to get into the the second round, uh, the round of the of the solution, and 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 here I think what what I'd like you um, 
uh, to do is that the Israeli participants um, uh, will present specific initiatives, the seventh eye in the uh, uh, Israel Journalists Union. Ellen, you will present the Online News Association and its code of ethics. Uh, we're going to get to that uh, 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 in a minute. So before that, I would like you, William, uh, to elaborate on one, what um, you would teach um, young journalists today. Uh, about media ethics. What advice and tips would you give them? What are the most important points to look at? Um, okay, so I look forward to hearing the prescriptions from my Israeli colleagues about Israeli journalism, because I, I, I can't lecture on that. I think it's really, really vigorous journalism here, so I wouldn't uh, do that. Um, in terms of telling young people, uh, uh, just on the ethical question, maybe I'll uh, limit myself to that. I, I would just tell them that you have a you have a, a, a trust between you and the reader that you're supposed to not um, you're supposed to tell the reader the best version of the truth that you have in the minute that you have it. And Ben Bradley, the deceased Washington Post famous editor, had a, had a, a statement that's often been mis. Uh, understood I think sometimes where somebody asked him something or pu or pushed him on some maybe panel like this one but a uh, larger one I'm sure but they, what do you know and he said you know we lay, he said something we don't print the truth we print what people say and then people said oh my god that's like uh, well, that's not right <laughs> but but there's a genius in that statement in the sense of that what journalists do is they go out and they ask people what they say and they they, they, they try to report uh, the, f the news and the facts of the moment, and they ask this one and they ask that one, and his opinion is slightly different from that one, and it's kind of our job to put them in a news story. And so I would tell young journalists to, um, uh, to be clear about that if you're gonna do journalism, not just opinion, that you have to seek out the opposing points of view and, 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 and shovel them into the newspaper and you have to be kind of strong about that where everyone just wants you to have sort of less, less than one side. And um, in terms of ethics, it's, it's such an open question now because their opinion is so in, embedded now in journalism and tweeting and, and social media and Facebook, but um, your deal is kind of with the reader, and um, if, if you file a story or you're done with some project or e even like something fast and you think, okay, that's like a straight, that's, that's the best I can do in the 45 minutes or 18 minutes or two days I have, like this is what I think, you know, based on, not my, what I think, this is what I've reported, then you've done your job. It's gonna be imperfect, it's gonna be crappy, it's gonna be overcome by events, it's going to be have big holes in it, it's not gonna have context, it's gonna be missing all these things. But I think if your star is to, North Star that you're headed towards is to try to get most of that in your short story or longer story, I think you're, you're on the road, right? Because journalism isn't just a profession, I mean, it is a profession, but it's uh, it's your life. You know, you only have one life. So, um, do you not. want do you want to be an honest, decent person about it, or you want to play games? Uh, I have a short comment. I think it's about something that Oren uh, wrote, uh, and if I'm wrong, correct me. Uh, I think the Oren published the story. Uh, based on two stories. One, I think, was in Yediot Achronot, and the other one, I think it was in Haaretz. That they both described uh, the Israeli army, the IDF, entering a Palestinian village. I think Yediot Achronot went with the army force, and uh, Haaretz, I think it was Amir Ha'es, uh, describe it from the point of view of uh, the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinians, and what Oren did, and I think it was Oren, or maybe Shuki, his uh, partner, that uh, uh, is that he took one paragraph from here, one paragraph from here, one paragraph from here, one paragraph from here. Mm -hmm. He took two narratives and made it uh, a journalistic work. He gave it the context. He said, "Okay, the story is not uh, just a narrative, a uh, journalistic story. It's." It's putting it in context. It's giving this narrative and this narrative and tell and give people to see the, the full puzzle. It was you? 
probably. <laughs> I mean, Shuki doesn't like to write a, a lot. I think it was six things. years ago. It yeah. wasn't yesterday or something. But mm -hmm. Not surprising. Though. That's a good story. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very good. It's answer. a great yeah. work. Um, so, Ellen, um, what I want to um, ask you is that uh, is to tell the story of the um, Online News Association. I highly recommend each one of you um, to enter the website of, of the Online News uh, Association. Um, why was it founded? How exactly um, did this journey of writing a very interesting, disassemblable um, uh, uh, ethic, uh, a code of ethics, um, that could be actually, you know, only only parts of it could be uh, 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 can be adopted, um, and also if you can elaborate on the question whether it actually has influence over mm -hmm. online uh, and digital journalism. Okay, one of the things be uh, the online news association ONA is a global organization of about two thousand digital journalists. Uh, who work in digital only or digital first media and it includes uh, people from the Associated Press and, and all over and it's international it isn't primarily in North American but it is international so before I even get into that one of the things I wanted to say is that in this last day of this conference and of course in, in the ongoing discourse of journalists has been the concern that traditional journalism or journalism is losing out to social media and there that is un undeniably a challenge for journalism. But I think that the core difference that can be and should be the way, I won't say the savior of journalism because there are other issues, is a return and a, re -aware a greater awareness of ethics. Because the one thing that can and should distinguish real journalism from propaganda, social media with an agenda, or fake news is a a personal and professional ethical stance, and then the kind of the consumer awareness of that. So the ONA decided, realized that it needed a new code of ethics for the digital age. And what it realized is that most codes of ethics were dusty documents stuck in the back of a newspaper newsroom um, on a wall and, and nothing much happened to them, and they were frozen in time. And so the idea is that in this digital age, with many kinds of individuals practicing journalism of many different formats, a single stone tablet of Ten Commandments of Journalism Ethics did not apply anymore, even if it ever had. And there are you know, traditional mainstream media like the Washington Post, which adhere generally to the so-called objective style of reporting. We could have a whole seminar just on that, and whether that is, exists or not. And then, frankly, in the Israeli media, as was just uh, described to us by Yair, uh, Haaretz and, and um, Yidiot or whoever practice more of a, a partisan or uh, a point of view form of journal journalism. That's kind of the term we used. And my training came in traditional newspaper, American newspaper journalism. But what I have come to realize, and I think is important to realize as we sit here right on this panel, is that both of these kinds of journalism are valid and can be valid if they're done in a conscious, transparent manner so that the audience knows. So whether or not Israel Hayom has upset the Israeli media marketplace, to me, is less relevant than whether people, than whether it is being honest about what its intentions are and people judge it for themselves. You know, Carl Bernstein... That is to say, transparency is the new objectivity. I wouldn't say transparency is the new objectivity. I'd say transparency is the new standard by which we need to judge journalism and media. So when Carl Bernstein was talking last night about it's not the role, at least his perception was, it's not the role of journalism to educate and lead the, the people to a re result, but to give them information to decide for themselves, the same way journalists need to be transparent about who they are and what their values are and to, in fact, let the consumer be aware. So when you buy a container of milk or a, 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 a container of yogurt, you have a long list. It's almost taken up the entire label. What's in it? When you buy a newspaper or read a website, you don't know what's in it. You know what the content is. You don't know what the ingredients are. You don't know whether it is 
owned by an NGO. It is owned by a businessman who's, or a woman whose goal is only to make money or who has a political agenda. You don't know if the journalists are paid or, or freelance. You don't know anything about them. So you're asked to buy, to use the American expression, a pig in a poke. Right? You don't know what you're getting. And so the idea behind the ONA project is to increase the awareness, consumer awareness, by leading journalists through a self-directed course in journalism ethics, at the end of which comes out a printable and hopefully uh, linkable code, personalized code of ethics, which says, I, I am a proponent of point of view journalism. I will take a free trip to a ski area when I get a story to write about it, but, but so you know. Or I, uh, as the great American new, uh, tech website, Recode has a, on its list, I write about Apple, my boyfriend works for Apple, I, work, I write about tech, my boyfriend works for Apple, I don't write about Apple. When Apple gives us a brand new iPhone to test, we give it back to them. Or if they won't give it to us, we buy it and then we just, we, we give it back to a uh, charitable organization. So the awareness of what your personal journalistic and your organization's journalistic ethos is, is right up there. It's like right next to the byline. You click and you see what your ethics are. So it can be anything. It doesn't have to be we are an objective journalism organization. It could be we're a point of view journalism organization. Amira Haas, check, I'm a point of view journalist. Okay, so now I have the tools by which to judge whether I believe her reporting. And that's the bottom line of this project is to allow journalists to think through who they are and what they do and then to tell the world about it so that in fact the world knows to judge for itself whether this particular article medium individual journalist is uh, acceptable. I think it's, it's a great idea and what I find so appealing in this approach is that it's, it, it takes in it in, as its starting point the objective of enabling rather than protecting the public because if we look at the, at the at media regulation throughout the 20th century, um, I, I think that the, um, uh, the main theme was this couch potato protecting approach uh, um, that was supposed to just, you know, leave the public protected in some, you know, way. Um, I want to move to um, to Yair. Um, I want you to um, uh, talk a little bit about your initiative to, uh, um, to obvious and simple one. The second thing is uh, talking about pure uh, worker rights issues. Uh, let's say in Yediot Achronot we had a collective agreement and uh, one of the things in that collective agreement uh, says that if you want to fire a journalist, I learned that in, in the United States you don't even have to give a just cause. You can tell him, okay, I don't want you, say, so, okay, bye-bye, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this is my friends in the union in the in the United States told me. So in Israel, you have to make an earring and really listen and show that you really want to give them uh, opportunity. And when we, we, but most of the times it's the same because the, the publishers will say, yeah, they are inventing something. Yeah, you came late two times, so you're fired. Uh, and one of the problem is that, let's say that I now want to publish an investigative story and the publisher don't want it because of his interest, he would never say, oh, no, you are fired because you try to investigate, you investigate the prime minister. He would say, no, you, you, you were late two times, so you are fired. And I think that uh, in, from, from that issue, the journalist need to know that he has things that protect him. Uh, and in, in Yetiot Achronot, if you want to uh, fire a journalist, first of all, you need to call him, tell him, okay, we have a problem, you are late too much times. Now you have a period of three months uh, where you can prove that you improved your ways. And if you, you, you didn't uh, get uh, late and, and even once, so they can fire you. Uh, and so it's, it makes all this issue of firing much more tr transparent and you have much more places where the union can enter and say, no, 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 you are saying that you are firing because he, he was late, but you are firing for another reason. And we, we showed it in the three, three months that he, he didn't get late. So 
it, it doesn't have to do nothing with journalists. It's, it's only a union tool, but it makes the, the journalists much more strong, and, and he, get, he gets the tools to say, no, I, I, I refuse to, cen to censorize myself, or I refuse to do things uh, that are not ethical. Um, the, third, the third thing is that we are trying to, one of the biggest problems of ethics uh, it's that you can, I don't know, do things that are not ethical and nothing would happen. So maybe in the first time you say, I know, I, I can do it, it's not ethical, and then you are doing it and say, oh, the, the, the sky didn't fall. So, uh, and most of the discussions about it, so there are people that say, okay, if it won't be by law, no one will accept uh, and, and practice the ethics. And the, 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 second, the, the other side says, no, 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 no. We can't uh, let the law enter to our journalist work. And I think what we are trying to do is take the collective agreement and say, let's put the ethical issues inside the collective agreements. And then you give him like the status of a law, but it's uh, as the status of law, and it's only between the journalist and the publishers. You don't need the parliament. You don't need all the law issues. And, and I think it's a good solution. We did it, in example, in Globes. Uh, the economical uh, newspaper when uh, we have inside of the collective agreement uh, um, the journalist and the publisher saying that both of us are obligated uh, to the ethics. Uh, if now the, the publisher is saying, no, I don't want uh, that the journalist would work like ethics, I could go to the court of law and, uh, and ask them to give to help me. Uh, for, from uh, another sentence, uh, and one of the things that the collective agreement says that if a journalist refuses to do something that is against the ethics, he can't be fired. And I think it, it brings us back from what I said in the first uh, part that I think it would, it's not something that would change tomorrow, but I think it's part of a big change that maybe in three or four years from now, journalists would be have much more the courage to say no and i think it's an it's an important thing and and it started uh, it's it's happening and enters to much more and more collective agreements thank you so much um Oren, um so um, i'll be happy if you could just um explain to us in what uh, in what sense um an initiative like the seventh eye actually fosters journalistic ethics in this uh, world, explain a little bit about, about its history, about its, its current situation, and so on and so forth. Okay. First, I just a uh, short comment. When I said that uh, ethics is a luxury, right, and we have to speak about corruption, I didn't mean there's no place for an ethical discussion, not at all. I just wanted to stress that the mm -hmm. situation is, is hard and difficult and to alert everyone that it, I think the terminology can be harsher than it is. As to the seventh eye, we try to uh, make journalism better through journalism. We are uh, NGO right now, and we write about uh, journalists. And we would like to be a mass media outlet explaining and teaching the mass audience how to critically read a newspaper or critically view a TV uh, program. But basically, that's, I think, impossible with our resources. So what we do, we aim for the journalists themselves. So uh, if someone like Yair, like 10 years ago, is in the desk, uh, the news desk, and has a situation where he is asked to do something which is unethical, we want his boss to know that we can publish a story about it. And we want him to know that he can come to us and tell us about it. And it's, it's uh, kind of a, a threat uh, to the uh, publishers that we, we are out there and we write about their flawed uh, practices. And we can do, you know, like a 20 um, um, word photograph item about the ignorance of an editor. And we can do a 20,000 piece, 20,000 word piece in-depth reporting about Globes, the financial newspaper that Yale mentioned, and how it served the interests of its owner, allowing him to uh, not declare bankruptcy for 10 years in the meantime, pushing all of his assets to his family members. And most of what we do is in between. Uh, we just 
write about uh, a lot of uh, the flawed practices, whether it's what is called uh, sometimes uh, native advertisement in, in, in Israel. It's, a ve it's, it's a very not well, um, you, you don't really know when it's uh, uh, native advertisement, when it's real content from the, from the uh, media, from the news desk. Uh, we write a lot about, <coughs> excuse me, what's happening with the uh, Palestinian, uh, I Palestinians with Israeli citizenship, what is called uh, Arab Israelis. We have a project with another NGO that deals with the amazing low uh, percentage of their uh, representation. representation in the Israeli media. They count for something like 20% <coughs> of the population in Israel, and uh, if you count the numbers of interviewees, they uh, roughly make it to 2%, maybe 3%, and over the last past year, we actually managed to uh, double and even triple uh, that percentage in specific programs that we uh, focused on. Um, so uh, we do that with just exposing what's wrong and with shaming the people who are in uh, control and who have the decisions. And the reason behind that is that eventually um, it's, it goes down to one person having to decide whether to stand up for what he believes in or whether to surrender and do what his boss wants. And we want just to give him another small push towards the ethical decision um, by knowing that, first, first of all, educating him to know that it's the right thing to do, uh, second of all, uh, making a threat to his publisher that if we learn about it, um, it will get public. And we know for a fact that uh, uh, mid-level uh, editors um, <coughs> read us and change their practices according to uh, what we write, and we can really feel the influence. And in it's small, it's nothing structural, but uh, you know, one step at a time, we, we feel that we're making a difference. No, I can totally testify that um, the Seventh Eye has become a, a journalistic hub uh, for, gen for, for media ethics in, uh, in right. Israel. Right, and just a, a, qu a quick uh, answer to what you said about our history. We started as a bi-monthly uh, print magazine in the Israeli Democracy Institute uh, 21 years ago. Uh, a decade ago, uh, approximately, we became a website. And from a bi-monthly magazine dealing with ethical issues and like a, a platform for journalists to speak amongst themselves about the problems of the profession, we became a much more on, on the minute, on the spot uh, news outlet really writing about what's going on every day in, in the industry. Interesting. So no doubts that the challenges um, um, around uh, media ethics, um, both in Israel and abroad, are, uh, uh, are huge. Um, some of the solutions that were presented here are inspiring um, as well. Um, I think uh, one thing that was not mentioned here uh, is, um, is the possibility of, of press counsel um, as a provider of standard marks on a voluntary uh, uh, basis. Uh, in this sense, we can uh, actually say that there are about 50 uh, uh, shades of regulation, uh, if we can talk about it. Yeah, we talk about in <laughs> incentivized regulation or voluntary uh, press council, or sometimes it's called co-regulation, um, uh, but there are so many um, uh, versions, um, uh, versions uh, uh, of that. Um, and also the uh, possibility that actually um, Ellen mentioned uh, uh, before as a ladybug seal of, of, of approval or seal of, 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 uh, of standards uh, that could be accompanied to uh, websites uh, or, um, or other media um, uh, outlets. Um, I want to take about a question or two from the audience if there are any, um, and then I'll just you know add some closing remarks. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Wait for the mic. Uh, Renee Garfinkel, uh, I'm with the Washington Times. Uh, b thank you, panelists. I think it was very interesting, enlightening, especially like the solutions you suggest. 
One of the things that's always uh, troubled me about journalism is that even though it likes to think of itself as a profession, there are no, unlike other professions, someone mentioned doctors and, and others, there's no licensing, there's no credentialing, there's no, there really are no standards that the reader can say, oh, this writer is a real journalist, as opposed to this writer who knows how to use a computer. Uh, and, and I think I understand the problems with that. It's easier for society to say you can't um, perform surgery without it being licensed versus you can't write about an event without being licensed. But the profession has really had the kinds of problems you were talking about from the very beginning. Uh, yellow journalism had a, a great run in the United States. And the notion of objectivity, I think, came to journalism fairly late. European um, newspapers are all affiliated with a political party. Uh, of course they have to tell the truth because they won't please the reader if they make things up and if you can't count on it, but it's clear that they have a point of view. So the notion of objectivity is one that I think journalism as a profession set up for themselves and had to fail. Um, I'd also like you to address the question of media monitors, um, of which there are millions now, people watching journalism and commenting on it. Do you feel that it helps? Does it improve the system? Or what do you think? Let me take, take just one more question, and we're going to answer them together. Oh. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, I can't take all questions. I'm sorry. I, I, it's a question to Alan and, and to Oran. <coughs> you, you said, Alan, ver that's very interesting about the airing dirty laundry and the, the journalists who are from the community which I understand Seventh Eye is an example. Yeah. And my question is, you to comment the Seventh Eye, if you're familiar with, because I don't know the projects, it seems very interesting. And <clears throat> to Oran, uh, when you publish a story, technically, uh, that a, a reporter was pushed by the publisher, uh, I understand the next day, this reporter is fired because, uh, I mean, the, the source of information, you expose that this reporter came to you saying his publisher is bad. So being a publisher, I would fire that guy anyway, next day. I would protect him. Yeah. <laughs> so so th this is my question, how technically it works that the, the, the journalists are not uh, fired next day. Thank you. OK, so two sentences by each one of you as answers, whoever wants to answer. Well, first of all, <coughs> I think the idea of uh, Let's just address the media monitors question that you brought up at the end, because otherwise we'd be here all day. 99 times out of 100, the media monitors of the left and the right are terrible, and they, have they add absolutely no value to the journalism. All they add is rhetoric and anger and frustration. Mr. William Booth here, I didn't bring this up because we didn't have the time. I took five minutes yesterday to Google Mr. Booth's critiques of Mr. Booth, and guess what? I found as many from the left, uh, Ali Abunama uh, of electronicintifada.net, and uh, readers on the right criticizing his coverage of Israel. He's either way, way pro-Israel and a closet Zionist, or he's absolutely devoted to destroying the state of Israel. And, I, and that happens on a daily basis to individuals like Booth and the New York Times and the International Journalist. So I will just end. I could talk about other things. I'll just end. They are absolutely worthless. William, do you want to say anything about that? You're okay. That's the, not a bad point. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I, I was listening to our, ourselves talking today, and your questions are, are, are excellent. I, I think th this would be a, a fascinating panel, too, to have uh, a year from now where, um, where I'm not on it, and Yer's not on it, and Oren's not on it. Maybe you two are on it. I'll where, probably where, no, moderate no, no, no. it. Where, where m the, my friend to my left is David Keyes from the Prime Minister's office. I'm gone. There's somebody from Israel Hayom or like a Elders of Zion blogger, uh, someone else here. You know, because w if we're talking about media, we often focus on this uh, 20th century version of myself, right? Which is uh, fast going off to Mars. So um, uh, media today 
is this uh, uh, fractious uh, prime minister's organization ginning out stuff, uh, 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 blogosphere, echo chamber, uh, from left and right, um, um, as, um, as, as Alan was saying, and, um, and many participants. And so where does Washington Post journalism smear into uh, Haaretz, smears into blogs, smears into Twitter, smears into something else? I mean, if that's how you're reading the press, your news, then that's your next year media panel. And you can ask them tough questions about whether elders of Zion or, or these various bloggers, I, I don't mean to pick them out, I mean, or the left or right, where their journalism ethics are. And that, that would be a fascinating conversation, and you would hear interesting things, I think. <laughs> It's true, though. Um, I'd like to ask uh, to add just one uh, more layer to the discussion and just close it uh, because Uri is uh, waving uh, 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 by now. I think what we can say is that they, they, they were there were traditionally traditionally there was one big problem in in Western democracies in terms of news and information landscape, and that was concentration of the media. When there weren't two or enough media outlets. I think that today we need to look at new ways for the powerful to game it. And by this I mean uh, the biggest platforms, Facebook and Twitter, and the fact that they actually, by their algorith algorithms, decide what we see and what we are being exposed to, and what, uh, in, in the, in the ethical questions that has to do with those issues are not or hasn't been uh, dealt with in this, uh, 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 in this pa panel. And in, in, and in a sense, I think that the real threat is, that is, when, is when technical progress is, is relied upon as a substitute uh, for moral progress. Um, in, in it, it could be it could be norms or values or, or you know just sustained fun functional democracies, but for sure social media is not going to be the thing to cultivate all those. Uh, now we understand that perhaps ten years ago we weren't so uh, uh, so sure about that. So the threads of, of technical and civic and, and ethical progress can be or, or must be rewoven, uh, and those also should be. Um, uh, uh, the participants for next year uh, 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 panel. And before I conclude, um, I thought I'd mention that um, uh, we've distributed an, an abridged version of of, um, of the Israel de of one of the Israel Democracy Institute's uh, latest publication, which is called Skepticism in the Newsroom. You can all uh, uh, see, perhaps uh, uh, take it. But we've initiated this project because we believe that, especially. Uh, when the journalistic immune system is becoming less capable of withstanding the forces of spin and, and deception, it is vital to present this guide to journalists to inspire them to ask questions. And I think this is the main, uh, um, uh, the main thing here, to start asking questions. And yeah, you know, you may accuse me, uh, accuse me of being uh, 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 naive, but you know, in, in cyberspace, uh, there's this term that is uh, uh, called social engineering. Uh, they like to uh, often uh, uh, use it, and I believe many parties um, are interested, or yeah, interested in in carrying out social engineering in the media. It could be politicians, it could be tycoons, it could be global companies, it could <laughs> it could be others. And I think it's the responsibility of all of us, um, and and the contribution of all of us to t to this Jewish notion of tikkun olam, of fixing the world, to conduct this reverse social engineering in Israel and elsewhere. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you next year. Thank you, thank you, uh, panelists, and thank you, Teila, for excellent uh, uh, moderation. Uh, Teila is also on the board of uh, JPC, so it's a good opportunity yes. to... Th and also, yeah, he of course, where, where I just, he just joined. He, we need, we give him three months, we give him three months to show if he's okay. Uh, <laughs> before we fire him. Teila, uh, Yair, Bill, Oren, Ellen, and again, Teila, thank you very much. We'll meet 10 after 2. Thank you very much. <laughs>